Humans like to put themselves at the center of history as the agents of change or perseverance or triumph. All well and good until you consider the animating thesis of Jonathan Kennedy's new book. It's called Pathogenesis, A History of the World in Eight Plagues. As the title suggests, Kennedy argues that germs, in fact, propelled some of the most significant shifts in human affairs. Jonathan Kennedy teaches politics and global health at Queen Mary University of London, and he's with us now on the line from London, UK, for more. Jonathan, it's good to have you on the air here. How are you? It's great to be here. I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. Let's start with a quote from the book. You write, the modern world has been shaped by microbes as much as by women and men. Now, that is going to come as news to anybody who's read some history. So help us out here. How so? Well, I think we have to start off with the way that we view the world. And I think our mindset is still very much stuck in the age of the Old Testament. So if we go back to the book of Genesis, uh, God supposedly created humans in his own image and gave us dominion over the natural world. So we still very much see this natural world as a stage on which humans, whether that's great men and women or classes, play out our roles. But actually, the more the more we know about the natural world, the more we realize that we're, we're it's not a stage. We're actually, you know, it's a system. It's an ecosystem. And if we want to live in that ecosystem successfully, then humans' role is actually pretty, pretty insubstantial. And there's there's actually many ways of, of kind of measuring the impact of, of microbes. And we can start off just with a few, a few facts about the numbers of microbes there are. So, for example, if we, if we tried to weigh all the bacteria that lived on the planet, they would weigh over a thousand times more than all the humans living on the planet. There was and another factoid, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, there's another factoid I think I remember from your book, which is to say that if we considered the natural world in its entirety, human, as a calendar year, for example, humans show up at, on December 31st. That's how not yeah, part of the story we have been for the longest time. Yeah, and just before midnight at, at that, um, maybe half an hour before midnight. So if we think um, bacteria have been around for something like three, three and a half billion years. And humans of any type have been around for a couple of million. Homo sapiens, 200,000, maybe a bit more than that. So, you know, it's an astonishing difference in time. And, you know, humans have had to, had to evolve to live in a world that is dominated and in many ways still dominated by microbes. So just to give you another 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 example, another factoid. Um, there's something like 40 trillion bacteria living in and on our body. So our microbe consists of of more bacteria than there are human cells in the in the body. And you know we increasingly understand the role that they play in things like um, digestion, and that's very much a, a hot topic in, in 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 popular science. But I think what we're beginning to understand is that they play other really important roles in our body and our, even our minds. So a particularly interesting piece of, of, of research recently looked at the DNA of bacteria in our feces. And it found that something like 90% of all the bacteria in our feces are capable of producing neurotransmitters, so chemical messengers um, um, that, that, that are able to influence our, our mood, things like serotonin, and and dopamine and this is this is just absolutely mind blowing um, and it also opens up some interesting questions for for medical science because perhaps in the future it would um, um, perhaps in the future we can really use use the power of microbes to deal with some major major health issues so even even dealing with depression so the same study found that people who had clinical depression were lacking in a couple of types of bacteria. And so perhaps in the future, the best way to treat clinical depression will be to um, put these bacteria into our guts rather than to treat it with something like um, therapy or, or Prozac, for example. Hmm. Well, let's go back and take a look at some various important stops through history. And our first stop is going to be the Paleolithic era. So once upon a time, Homo sapiens shared the planet with Homo neanderthals. And Homo sapiens won the contest with the Neanderthals, and you're going to tell us why. Well, I mean, I think the first thing to remember is 
the the dominant explanation for for why and you know most textbooks tell us that humans won out because we were we were smarter we were more intelligent this is even implicit in the name that we give ourselves homo sapiens so wise wise humans um and actually one of the one of the nice little snippets that i i found out when i was researching this book was in the 19th century there were some scientists that seriously proposed that neanderthals should be referred to as homo stupidus so that really kind of um <laughs> underlines this 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 kind of wise stupid dichotomy through which we see um we see ourselves and, and neanderthals um but actually when we look at the evidence that's been gathered over the last 10 years we see that neanderthals really aren't that much different to um, our own species to homo sapiens um, we now know that they buried their dead possibly even that they lay flowers on the graves of the dead we know that they looked after their sick we know that they used various um medicinal herbs to treat maladies we know that they talked to one another there's even evidence that they were able to sail um, or travel by boat between islands in the eastern eastern mediterranean they painted caves so this builds up this image of of neanderthals as you know not that different to to us so that raises the question why did they disappear 50 50 000 years ago um whereas we we survived and i think the most most powerful explanation is that homo sapiens who had evolved in um tropical africa carried more and more deadly infectious diseases as we migrated out of out of the african con continent and so when we came into contact with neanderthals um they got very sick and and died out um and so so yeah even from the the very beginning of human prehistory really you see the important role of infectious diseases. So it wasn't so much our brains, we just had better immune systems. Yeah, or even we we, we, we carried more diseases and we were, we had evolved um, to, to be resistant to those diseases. We'd, we'd evolved over, over you know, 100,000 years or so. All right, let's go to the next era we want to focus on, and that's the Neolithic era and the advent of farming. And here's what you write about that. It is remarkable to think that the impact of the migration of a small number of shepherds out of the Western Eurasian steppe 5,000 years ago, which was most likely made possible by a devastating plague pandemic, can literally still be seen and heard today across the world. Okay, what do you mean by that? Still seen and heard today across the world. Well, if we go back to about 5,000 years ago, which is when Stonehenge was first built, um, the population of the British Isles and most, most of Western Europe were um, a group of olive-skinned, dark-eyed people who had migrated across Europe and brought farming, farming with them. And all of a sudden, um, about 4,500 years ago, these people disappear from, from Great Britain or from the British Isles and they're replaced by a new group of people who are taller, um, they often have blue eyes and they have fairer features and they originated from um, the far east of Europe on the, on the steppe, these vast grasslands where they'd been um, shepherding, shepherding animals. And, you know, again, this has been a, a really, a really kind of difficult mystery to solve. Why did this happen? Why did a why did a well-established farming community um, seemingly disappear? And um, there's an increasing amount of evidence that suggests that this was a plague pandemic. So um, this evidence comes from ancient DNA. So over the last 10 years, scientists have really, really improved their techniques for extracting and um, analyzing DNA from really, really, really old bones. But when they extract the DNA, they don't just get human genetic material, they also get the material of the microbes that were in our blood, in, in, in the blood at the time of death. And so by looking at this DNA, this microbial DNA, you can get a pretty good idea of what people were, were dying of um, 5,000 or so, so years ago. And there's been a number of finds over the last few years of plague, um, you know, basically across Europe from, um, from, from England um, all the way you know, in Sweden, in Germany, in Latvia, all the way to the far 
to the Far East. So this builds this picture of a, a devastating plague pandemic um, that cleared the way for these, these um, shepherds about kind of four and a half, four thousand years ago. And remarkably, these these shepherds that, 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 that they basically brought um, their genetic material, but they also seem to be the source of um, Indo-European languages. Um, so the languages that are spoken by people in, well, I guess Canada um, for, 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 for one, but also in in much of Europe, um, in Central Asia, and even in in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent. So it's really remarkable, I think, that we can still literally see and hear the consequences of this, this pandemic that occurred four and a half, five thousand years ago. Let's bring you a little more closer to our time. Well, we're still going to be 2,000 years ago, the Roman <laughs> Empire. How did infectious diseases weaken the Roman Empire? Yeah, well, I think an important point from the book is that, you know, kind of what we might see as development often creates kind of new conditions in which infectious diseases can can prosper. So in the first couple of centuries of the um, first millennium, Rome was a really remarkable polity. You know, it kind of, um, it Rome ruled a, a vast area all the way from Scotland in the, in the Northwest to the Arabian Peninsula. Um, it was incredibly, prosperous. Um, Rome was a city of a million people. Um, so basically, the, the next city to be this big was London in the 19th century. And that just gives you an idea of how remarkable Rome, Rome was. Um, but this kind of level of urbanization and the incredible amount, the, the incredible extent of interconnectedness um, in the Roman Empire created the perfect conditions for infectious diseases to spread. And so you have a couple of devastating plagues in the second and third centuries, the um, Antonine Plague and the Plague of Cyprian, which really kind of devastate the Roman, the Roman Empire. And you can, you can see this, for example, in um, ice cores that have been drilled in Greenland recently, that there's a, a drop in um, lead pollution around the time of these pandemics, which seem to show that the economy just basically kind of um, stopped um came to a came to a sudden sudden halt because the majority of lead pollution would have come from processing silver which was used for for the the the, the, the currency so yeah again infectious diseases played a really important role in the in the slow steady decline of the roman empire and how about in the rise of two of the world's most significant religions christianity and islam what role did they play there yeah so there's a big a big kind of again a big mystery with Christianity. Um, it didn't just become a an empire wide religion when Jesus was was crucified. Um, for the first 200, 250 years after Jesus's death, um, it was a pretty small religion um, with maybe about a hundred thousand follow followers at the beginning of the of the third third century. So that was less than one percent of the whole Roman. Roman population. And then all of a sudden, towards the end of the third century, you see this absolute explosion in the number of, of Christians. And um, you know, why this why this was the case is a is you know kind of a really, really important question. And I think a a convincing answer to to this is that Christianity um basically provided a much more assuring guide to life and death, life and death during pandemics. Than paganism. Paganism basically said that you know the here and now is all that there is, and that pandemics are a result of the the gods' anger. We're not quite sure what often, but the the anger of the gods, and in particular Apollo. But Christianity, Jesus's message, um, really emphasised the role of suffering in this life, um, and saw that as a key to gaining entrance to an everlasting paradise in the next. And also there was a big stress in Christianity on, on doing, doing good, good deeds. So there are, there are eyewitness accounts of, of basically the, the pagans abandoning their sick and running off to the countryside to try and survive the, the plague. But the Christians came and looked after them. And even basic nursing, like providing water and food, meant that something like two thirds of those people who had been abandoned survived. 
And this created the best, the best commercial that any religion could have, really, which is miracles or something that seemed to be a, a miracle. And also the same with, with, with Islam and it's, you know, what seems on the face of it to be miraculous growth in the hundred or so years after the death of the prophet Muhammad in 632. So um, within a century and a bit of, of, of Muhammad's death, you see Islam has spread out from the Arabian Peninsula um, and, and, and kind of Arabian Islamic armies control an empire that goes all the way from, from Spain and Morocco in the West to the borders of China in the, in the East. And we can only really understand this in the context of plagues that were devastating both the Roman, the late Roman and the Persian empires at this, at this time. And these were very urban, very well connected empires. Whereas the, the people living in the Arabian Peninsula were largely protected from these these plagues because they were often nomadic and if they weren't nomadic it was still a very sparsely populated area so um when, when, when these two big empires the the romans and the and the persians were being weakened and weakened this relatively increased the power of the arab muslim armies and when the time was right they they pushed out of the the peninsula and spread really really quickly Let's talk about the Black Death in the medieval era, and you write that without the Black Death, we might still be in the Middle Ages. Okay, explain that if you would. Yeah, so I think the thing that you have to remember is that in the Middle Ages, in the feudal system, there was very little incentive for anybody to, um, to, to innovate, particularly um, agricultural producers. The vast majority of the population were, were, were farmers, agricultural producers, because... Um, you know, if you were a feudal lord, um, it was a very unstable system. You were probably warring a bit with your with your neighbours, so there was a big incentive to play to, to basically spend any surplus resources on building defences and developing your your army. And if you didn't do this, if instead you focused on building windmills or on irrigation, then it was likely that someone would come along and and conquer your your territory. And even if you were a uh, a serf, a peasant, um, there wasn't much incentive to to produce lots of lots of stuff because it was likely that the lord was just going to take it away from you. The um, in incentive structure basically was such that you know it was best to be risk averse and to plant a variety of different crops on different parts of the the lord's estate to make sure that um, you know if something was devastated by disease or extreme weather events or um, wild animals, then at least you'd have something else to live on for the for the year. Um, and it seems so. So it would have seemed um, at the beginning of the 1300s that basically this this feudal system might kind of stay like that for forever. But then all of a sudden you have the Black Death, um, which comes from Central Asia and arrives in the middle of the 1300s and kills over half of the population in about five years. And you know, that's devastating, but then you have secondary plagues and then you have other instances of plague coming back again and again and devastating the, the population. So the English population doesn't recover its pre-Black Death size until the 18th century. And this demographic shock basically um, creates a, a struggle between the serfs and the feudal lords. Um, and this plays out over a hundred years, maybe even even longer, but eventually you get to the end of this this struggle, and the serfs have won the won their freedom. But basically, the the lords end up renting out large plots of land to entrepreneurial peasants um, at market rates, and so these peasants um, basically become commercial farmers, and they have to invest in the latest technology and grow crops that are particularly suited to the area where they're growing them, and this leads to a a boom in agricultural production that um, basically basically kickstarts capitalism and um, you know again changes the world in ways that we're still very much feeling feeling today for better and for worse. So you can actually draw a direct connection between the Black Death and capitalism. Yeah, there's a there's a very clear kind of chain of events that um, that, that, that link the two. Hmm. Okay, let's. Um... 
You know, there's so much history in this book, and we haven't got time to cover it all in one <laughs> conversation, but I do want to get a better understanding of this. How did writing this book change you and how you thought about history differently? Well, I guess I was like everyone else, um, you know, kind of I was brainwashed into thinking that, you know, kind of humans are, are the driving force of, of history. And so I think, you know, really kind of spending a couple of years reading about infectious diseases and reading about their role on human history, I guess it makes you a bit more humble and it makes you realize that, you know, we really are living in a finely balanced world. And if, we, if we're not careful, you know, uh, a, our species will, will really come into to some trouble. But I think, I think as well, you know, you just come to the realization that although we like to think that COVID was a, an aberration, a kind of once in a century occurrence, when you look back at history, you realize this, that this isn't the case. You know, there's nothing particularly unusual about the, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, in fact, you know, there's periodic cases throughout history of, 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 of kind of these devastating pandemics coming along and, you know, really causing massive death and disruption. And so I think the the key thing is that we need to to realize that you know we have to prepare for the next pandemic in the best way way possible and that means on the one hand um you know kind of people with a, a medical background developing um their understanding of diseases and of cures and preventions to, the, to those diseases but also we need to really understand how our society creates habitats that allow infectious diseases to to flourish um you know, certainly in many ways, we're living now in a new golden age for for microbes. Um, the unprecedented size of the world's population, the encroachment on, on animal habitats, um, industrial scale factory farming, and also the, the ease with which we can travel across the world very, very quickly. These combine to create, you know, the perfect conditions for pathogens to jump from from other species to, to humans and to spread around the world really, really quickly. So we have to be, be one, be prepared for this, but also try to try to kind of mitigate the, the chance of that happening. Well, just in our last 30 seconds here, I mean, if there's one big takeaway from your book is that the next disaster is, uh, I mean, you can set your watch to it. It's never that far away. And I wonder whether you think we yet understand how the disaster we have just come through, COVID-19, is going to rewrite this next chapter of our history? Well, I think it's a fool's errand for people to try to predict the future, but um, certainly I think we can we can feel that COVID is having an impact sometimes for, for the good if we think about work from home. And I'm not sure how things are in, in Canada, but certainly in this country, sky high inflation, res inflation rates are really causing a lot of, a lot of problem. And again, you can trace that back to the to the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. So I think we won't really know for years to come, but certainly the world after the pandemic is very different to the one one before it. And I think the, you know, to finish on an optimistic note, on, on an optimistic note, we we really have to ensure that the the change that COVID has brought about is is positive and um, work towards that. The name of the book is Pathogenesis, A History of the World in Eight Plagues. It has brought Jonathan Kennedy to our virtual studio from London, UK. It's a great pleasure to meet you, and thanks for joining us tonight on TVO. Oh, it was really lovely. Thank you for, for, for the time. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.